Beginning in 1811, a group of textile workers took a stand by burning and smashing power looms and frames across northern England in an act of rebellion against the machines that had replaced them and the employers who had fired them. This movement lasted over seven years, but the lasting outcome was a Kickstarter for other labor movements and has even spread to modern times through Neoletism. Ned Ludd was the leader of the Luddites, but there is no actual proof he existed. His name came from an apprentice weaver who smashed a loom because he was angry at his employer who had harassed him. The Luddites created a song for him, relating to the Robin Hood myth. The song went, Chant no more your old rhymes about bold Robin Hood. His feats I little but admire. I will sing the achievements of General Ludd, now the hero of Nottinghamshire. Brave Ludd was to measures of violence unused till his sufferings became so severe that at last to defend his own interest. In the Napoleonic Wars that lasted from 1803 to 1815, the Luddites faced hardships when the wars changed England's trade with other countries. It all started when the U.S. issued the Embargo Act. They stopped trade with foreign countries, which caused a rise of manufacturing and new technology. These new innovations soon traveled to England and replaced the jobs of many textile workers. The Luddites' first act of rebellion was in Arnold Nottingham in 1811. They destroyed 63 wide frames, which were frames that were worked by cults or those who hadn't served the usual seven-year term. This act wasn't directed to the wide frames or cults, but the employers who had relied on them during the trade depression. The more skilled workers thought that the employers should fire the cults before them because they weren't as experienced and hadn't been there as long. Raymond Boudon, a sociologist, wrote in his book, Analysis of Ideology. The Luddites did indeed understand the advantages which mechanization would bring. Their machine wrecking was an attempt to show their owners of the textile mills that they were a force to be reckoned with, that they were a nuisance value. By acting this way, their main objective was to gain concessions from the employers. This strategic interpretation of the Luddite movement is confirmed by the fact that the workers often destroyed only those machines that were turning out faulty goods. It was still true, of course, that a worker who went on strike could easily be replaced by someone from the army of employed people willing to be strike breakers, at a time where nascent trade unionism was harshly suppressed. Since the machine breaking brought the factory to a halt, it was not only a functional substitute for striking, it was also much more effective. This quote shows how the Luddites were aware of what they were doing by smashing frames and had strategically thought their plans out. This also explains why the Luddites decided to start smashing frames and didn't just continue to be on strike because they knew they would be needed once the machines had been smashed. In Yorkshire in January 1812, the Luddites were led by croppers, skilled finishers of long cloth, in an attempt to destroy William Raffold's mill. Unfortunately, the attack had failed because Raffold had heard and had sent troops to guard the mill. Two Luddites were killed, which caused more riots. This attack was seen as a turning point in Yorkshire Luddism. Charlotte Bronte described some of the events in this attack in her book, Shirley. She said, Misery generates hate. These sufferers hated the machines which they believed took their bread from them. They hated the buildings which contained those machines. They hated the manufacturers who owned those buildings. Her words show that the Luddites deeply hated anyone or anything involving the loss of their jobs. In February of 1812, the Frame Breaking Act was issued by Parliament to the Luddites. This act said that anyone who was caught smashing frames would be killed. The Parliament also sent about 12,000 troops to the place where Luddite riots were common. During the discussion about the bill, Lord Byron, an English and grounded poet who was very influential through his words, made his famous speech in the Luddites' defense at the House of Lords. In his speech, Lord Byron said, By the adoption of species of frame in particular, one man performed the work of many, and the superfluous laborers were thrown out of employment. Yet it is too so to be observed that the work, thus executed in inferior quality, 
not marketable at home, and merrily hurried for the view of exploration. It was called, in the cant of trade, by the name of spider work. The rejected workmen, in the blindness of their ignorance, instead of rejoicing at these improvements in art, beneficial to mankind, conceived themselves to be sacrificed to the improvements of mechanism. The Luddites faced many challenges while rioting. Some were held at gunpoint, were shot, or even hung. The historian Eric Hodgson said, There can, of course, be no doubt of the great feeling of opposition to new machines, a well-founded sentiment, in the opinion of no less an authority than the great Ricardo. Yet three observations ought to be made. First, this hostility was neither so indiscriminate nor so specific as has often been assumed. Second, with local or sectional exceptions, it was surprisingly weak in practice. Lastly, it was by no means confined to workers, but was shared by the great mass of public opinion, including many ma manufacturers. Hobbes one communicates that the riots were more an act of symbolism than an act of hatred or destruction. He also explains that even though the Luddites were only a small group of people, many people had their own ideas and opinions about how they felt towards their frame-smashing riots. Luddism influenced lots of others to protest, like the Swing Rioters and the Rebecca Rioters. Swing Rioters were farm workers who smashed threshing machines and fought for an increase in wages. The Rebecca Rioters were tenant farmers who protested opposing fees that they had to pay to use the roads that groups of businessmen had made. Both riots are very similar to what the Luddites stood for, fairness for the less fortunate. The Luddites' greatest outcome was the effects it had on other movements or that it changed the way people in England viewed workers' rights. Another outcome of Luddism is Neo-Luddism, or the opposition to any technological or scientific innovations. However, Luddism ended because of the disturbing deaths that some Luddites were facing. After the Napoleonic Wars, the Victorian Compromise, also known as the Victorian Period, came into effect. This period was made up of the wealthy upper class gaining power and the new jobless Luddites in poverty and facing their new reality. <laughs>